Hi guys, in this video we'll look at an introduction to polysaccharides, energy stores, starch, the structure of starch with amylose, the structure of starch with amylopectin, glycogen, and then we'll finish with a summary. So polysaccharides are another type of carbohydrate, and they're long, complex carbohydrates. And we call them polysaccharides because they're made of many saccharides. So some polysaccharides can be found in certain foods, for example bread, we can find them in rice, and various types of pasta as well. And they're a very important carbohydrate. So a polysaccharide is basically a polymer of carbohydrates made up of many monosaccharides. So remember the simplest form of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide. And when we join lots of these up as monomers, we end up with one long chain, which we describe as a polysaccharide. Poly meaning many. Remember that two would be a disaccharide, but more than this is many, and we just name it as a polysaccharide. We tend to say that in order to be a true polysaccharide, they need to have more than 10 monosaccharides joined together into a chain. Any smaller chains than 10 tend to be called oligosaccharides. So these kind of terms can be seen in lots of biological molecules. Mono always means one, di means two, oligo tends to mean about three to 10, and poly is more than 10. So in this case, we have eight monosaccharides. So this would be an oligosaccharide. So it does depend on how many there are as in terms of what we call it. And saccharide is referring, of course, to carbohydrates. So obviously you can see these prefixes in lots of types of biological molecule as well, like proteins and nucleic acids. But in the case of carbohydrates, we're talking about saccharides. So in order to create these polysaccharides, we form them by joining together monosaccharides in a series of condensation reactions. So remember, condensation reactions are what join monomers together to perform polymers. So each time a monosaccharide is added to another monosaccharide, also a growing chain, there's going to be a condensation reaction. So we might start off first with two monosaccharides, and as they come together and are joined by a condensation reaction, we end up with two monosaccharides joined together into one unit called a disaccharide. And then to increase the length of this chain, we just need to simply increase it by adding another monosaccharide. And again, a condensation reaction adds this extra monosaccharide to form this now trisaccharide or oligosaccharide. Again, this can then be added with more and more and more until they keep growing in size to form a polysaccharide. But as you can see, each time a monosaccharide is added, it's a condensation reaction adding on a unit every time. In the reverse of this, polysaccharides are broken down in the reverse of condensation, which is hydrolysis. And there's a series of hydrolysis reactions to form individual monosaccharides. But this can happen in a couple of different ways. Let's say we start off with this polysaccharide, or oligosaccharide, and we want to break it down into its four individual monosaccharides. We can do it either by snipping off one monosaccharide at a time from a chain and going in this direction. And every time this happens, we have a hydrolysis reaction. And then in the end, we would be left with four monosaccharides. Alternatively, we can do it a different way, whereby the oligosaccharide is snapped in half to give two disaccharides, and then each of these are broken down into their individual monosaccharides, again to give four monosaccharides. But the main point is, either way, it's always done by hydrolysis reaction, snipping off monomers at a time. They're different to monosaccharides and disaccharides because polysaccharides are not sweet tasting and they're not very soluble, so they don't dissolve very well in solutions. So they're not what we call sugars, whereas disaccharides and monosaccharides were. But polysaccharides come in much more variety, and the reason is because of the following. We can change the type of monosaccharide that we incorporate into a polymer. So for example, say we chose alpha-glucose as the monosaccharide. If we were to add that into a chain into a polymer, we end up with a molecule called amylose. If we incorporate beta-glucose, the other isomer of glucose, we end up with a completely different polymer known as cellulose. And just by changing the monosaccharide by a tiny amount, the actual structure of the overall polysaccharide and the properties are very different. We can also change not only the monosaccharide, but how the monosaccharides bond together. So for example, in both of these cases, we have alpha-glucose as the monosaccharide. But in this case, we have a particular type of bonding called 1,4 glycosidic bonding. And this gives us amylose. But in this case, we have 1,4 and 1,6 glycosidic bonding. 
Don't worry too much about what 1, 4 and 1, 6 mean because we'll get onto this. But by having different types of bonding present, we can make different types of molecules. And this one is amylopectin. So by changing different features of polysaccharides, they can get multiple different properties and have very different functions. Polysaccharides are important energy stores for both plants and animals. Plants and animals need to carry out respiration, and the main source of this is alpha glucose. It's the main source of energy for any respiration in any cells. So a molecule of glucose is combined with a molecule of oxygen. In respiration, these produce the waste products CO2 and water, but the important product that they produce is ATP, and it's from this ATP that we can release energy. So plants and animals need to do this. Even though plants carry out photosynthesis, which is the reverse, they need energy to do other processes like growing, repairing themselves, and defending themselves against pathogens. But sometimes we have too much glucose more than we need, if we've had a sugary meal, for example. So excess chemical energy can be stored in the cells by forming polysaccharides of alpha glucose. So instead of just letting the alpha glucose build up, we add it to a long growing chain so that we can store it away until it's needed. Because each of those individual alpha glucoses are what we need for respiration, but sometimes if we don't need to produce any energy at the moment, or we've got too many of this, we can just add them into a long growing chain. So polysaccharides of alpha glucose are seen in animals and plants as a good storage energy, and they're well suited for energy storage for several reasons. The first reason is they're physically very compact, so we can pack a lot of energy stored into a small space. So here is a kind of overview of one of the polymers, or polysaccharide, made of alpha glucose. And you can see that in a relatively small space, we've got lots and lots of alpha glucose stored in multiple chains and branches. And so taking up small space is good because then we don't need to have such massive cells and take up a lot of wasted room. Another reason they're good at storing energy is because they're insoluble in water. They don't dissolve. And because of this, they don't make any impact on the water potential of a cell. To illustrate why that's important, let's take, for example, the idea that cells store alpha glucose as it is. So let's pretend that cells did actually store alpha glucose just as it is floating around the cytoplasm. Because it's very soluble as a monosaccharide, the water potential of the cell will go down because as a solute, it's bringing that water potential down. And this means that through the membrane, water will be drawn in by osmosis. And if too much water is drawn into the cell, the cell bursts open and it dies in a process known as cytolysis or cytolysis. So this would be bad. So as a result, what they do instead is they store it as long polysaccharides and water does not allow it to be dissolved. It does not dissolve in the water and so the water potential stays the same. So inside the cell, we wouldn't have individual monosaccharides, we would have polysaccharides and therefore no extra water would be drawn in and the cell is safe from cytolysis ever happening. Another important property is that polysaccharides are very large complex molecules, so they don't just diffuse in and out of the cell. If they did, we would lose it very quickly. Monosaccharides, like the individual alpha glucose, can easily leave or enter the cell via carrier proteins. So it's only really taken in or lost whenever it's needed. But a polysaccharide is too large and so it can't just leave via these proteins. It will never get through that membrane. And finally, another property is that it can be easily hydrolyzed to alpha glucose monosaccharides whenever the energy is needed. So let's say that this is the end of a very long polysaccharide. And let's say that the cell needs to suddenly increase its energy use, so we have a high energy demand. These are acting as a store, so whenever the cell needs energy, it need only come over to this molecule and start cutting off these alpha glucoses. So what we have are enzymes, which can easily access the end of the polysaccharide, and essentially they work by snipping off the alpha glucose, usually in groups of two, and then they're free to be used in respiration. So it's easily accessible and easily hydrolyzed, remembering that these reactions snipping off the molecules are going to be hydrolysis. So this table just summarizes the properties of polysaccharides, making it suitable for an energy store, and they're very important points that you need to learn. So the property of polysaccharide, it's a very large molecule, so it can't just diffuse out of the cell, so we don't lose it. It's insoluble, so it doesn't affect the osmotic balance of the cell. It's compact, so lots of energy can be stored in little spaces. And it's easily broken down in hydrolysis, so it's readily accessible whenever the energy demand arises.
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.